Hello and welcome to another Data Science Cornwall video. Today we're going to be talking about some of the interesting ideas that emerged from a data challenge that we set recently. The um, data challenge was looking at data collected from space. Um, it's a real um, space mission um, collecting um, measurements of radiation in the X-ray gamma ray range um, from objects in space and in particular something called Cygnus X3. So it's quite exciting because it's real data, it's really meaningful and there's a possibility that we might discover something new in the data that uh, perhaps no one else has before. Um, it's also interesting and nice actually to be able to be working with real data rather than something artificially constructed. It makes the thing a little bit more meaningful and, and um, worthwhile. So Cygnus X3 is a bit of an unusual object. Um, most things, or not most, but many things in space uh, fit a kind of category. They're easily classified as a certain kind of star or a certain kind of object. Um, Cygnus X3 was not so easy to classify. And the way we classify objects is primarily by looking at them and trying to use the what we see, the radiation that we collect on Earth or just outside Earth, to try and kind of work backwards and understand what kinds of objects give off that kind of radiation and, and then infer whether it's, you know, an old star or a black hole or something else. Now Cygnus X3 is considered one of the brightest X-ray sources in the sky. That means in the sky it's the most kind of loud in terms of the x-rays that it emits but the pattern um, that of x-rays that it emits um, are is a little bit puzzling I mean it doesn't fit um, a, you know, an easily compartmentalized um, kind of shape um, it's been hard to classify um, over the years more and more evidence has grown around what it is and we now think it's um, a binary system um, with two things that are rotating around each other. Um, but even then it gives off radiation, which again is uh, a little bit surprising. So there's still scope today for us to discover something new and interesting about this um, Cygnus X3 system. So the SWIFT um, space mission um, measures radiation um, in the form of, sort of photons hitting a detector and I've been able to um, get hold of some of that data um, and we'll be working with it. And what's, what the data file contains is, um, well, many of these columns, um, but we'll be primarily focusing on um, the time, the timestamp and the rate column, which is a, kind of an indication of how much radiation is collected at that time, um, count per centimeter squared per second. So it's kind of um, a radiation meter. So the reason we look at, um, uh, as we said earlier, looking at data, if we can find patterns in the data, then those patterns must have come from some kind of physical process, um, which tells us something about the reality, the real kind of physics of Cygnus X3. Um, now, as I said at the start, some of the behavior of Cygnus X3 is not particularly um, fully understood. I mean, consensus is growing, but it's it's not quite a hundred percent there. Um, and there is scope today to you know, spot new things in the data, which might reveal something really interesting about Cygnus X3. But we, this is what we do with you know most objects in space. We look for patterns in the data. You know whether there's something in a certain range, um, and then we can work backwards from that uh, to make some conclusions around. What the object is. So let's first look at the data and this is, um, a re you know, as we do this talk we'll be raising some interesting principles around how we should approach data exploration, data mining um, challenges. And there's some really kind of good good practice that we should try and um, um, stick to. Um, so the first one is look at the data before you can dive in with your kind of set of tools and libraries and kind of magic functions. 
So I've set up um, um, a, a kind of Python notebook um, and I'll be sharing this as well so you can have a go yourselves. If you weren't part of the challenge, um, you can still have a go yourselves. Um, what I won't do today is talk a lot about the meaning of all the instructions because today's talk really isn't about Python, the language or the libraries, but we'll be talking in terms of principles and the ideas and you can look up the kind of syntax easily yourselves. So first we'll do is import pandas, which is a nice common library for working with sets of data. It's a kind of, you can think of it as enables us to work with tables of data. Um, it's a very useful uh, library because it's got very useful functions like plotting and summarizing and statistics, transformation, um, and also allows us to pull in data uh, and read it, you know, if it's a CSV. So that's what the next line does. We're actually going to pull it from a URL which is actually um, my drive, and I'm sharing the um, the data, the CSV file. And you can dig into what some of those um, command options mean. Um, you know, we're only picking the time in the rate column. We're telling it that the, the hash symbol is the comment, um, and so on. So it's told us that it's pulled in 67,220 data rows. Um, and it's given them um, a column name in time and rate, and it's taken about a meg of memory. Great. We should always take a look at the data and uh, using the dot head for data frames just gives us the top of the data. So you've got lots of data. You don't want to look at all of it, but this just gives a quick check to see what it, what the nature of that data is. And we can see there's two columns with time and rate. Great. Um, so, as we said, the first thing we should do before we dive in, and I can't stress this enough, is look at the data, get a feel for what it's like. Is it kind of very well ordered? Is it chaotic? Has it got lots of noise in it? Does it even look right? Um, get that sense first. So I'm going to plot um, the data, and you can see already that, you know, horizontally is the time axis, and vertically is the remaining axis, which is the the radiation rate and we can see there's some variation but then it jumps really down to minus 25 here whereas most of the other numbers are somewhere in the I don't know minus 1 to plus 1 range so there's something going on here um, so you know, as we explore data one thing we're looking out for is obvious errors and outliers now it's not straightforward to say that's definitely an error because that might actually be a spike in the data. Um, so as we proceed, we make a hypothesis to say we think that's an error. And when we proceed, we make sure that we understood that assumption. Um, we could test and we can sort of say, well, what does it mean if that was um, you know, a spike in radiation? Um, but as you say, there's, there's no firm and hard rules here. Everything we do has to be on the basis of assumptions that are then tested or confirmed in other ways. So I'm going to proceed by saying that because it's negative rather than positive, um, that's an error because when we've got sort of, you know, radiation meters that are counting photons per second per unit area, um, that should be positive. You don't get negative amounts of photons. Um, so there might be noise in the electronics, there might be something else going wrong, there might be an error in translating from the counts, you know, from the sensor into sort of you know, floating point numbers. Um, in fact, there shouldn't really be negative values, so there might be something going on there. Um, so a first step as we explore the data, you know, in, a, in an initial kind of discovery phase, is to say, let's, let's kind of remove that because we think that's definitely wrong. So let's look at um, how many of those data points are less than zero. And out of about 65, 67,000, um, we have only um, 2,800 that are less than zero. And we can see those there. Now we could um, be more sophisticated and say, we'll only consider um, data as an error if it is outside a certain um, error range 
So you might say, you know, standard deviation or three standard deviations or something like this. That's that's a you know a, a more sophisticated approach. Um, but I'm going on this sort of you know slightly uh, brutal assumption that anything less than zero is an error. We can come back and revisit that if we don't find anything. By the way, I should have said uh, the challenge was to find some da- interesting patterns in the data using any ideas or any um, any tools you like. So quite open ended. And and in the group in the in the uh, first kind of session we had, the uh, the uh, we, the aim was to set out the problem, and in part two of the um, the session, which was a week later, we just caught up with everyone to see what ideas they had, um, and I think if I'm correctly remembering, I don't think anyone found any um, patterns in the data, so it's quite a tough problem. Um, <clears throat> right, so about two, three thousand of those um, are less than zero. So if we remove them, it's not a massive uh, loss in data, um, but it isn't tiny either. Um, as I say, a more sophisticated approach might be to remove data outside a certain kind of error range or an estimate of say two, three, four standard deviations. Um, but for now, we'll just try this to see if it, if it takes us anywhere. And, and the point there is um, we're just experimenting and trying. When you explore data yourself, don't jump in with the most sophisticated approaches straight away. It's okay to try kind of, you know, easy, almost brutal approaches, because if they reveal something first, then you've done it in an economical way. You've not spent lots of time coming up with very sophisticated schemes. You've, you know, you've, you've got there um, straight away and then later you can optimize your data mining process. Great. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's clean the data, which means in this case, we've decided to remove um, all those points that were below zero. So we've done that now. Um, I've been a bit naughty by giving the data frame the same name. So now we've got 64,403 data items. And again, plot it again, you know, always good to see the, the impact of each step. And now we can see more of the detail because we've got rid of that very, very large spike. And here, um, what can we see? Well, we can see spikes and we can see um, most of the radiation to be within a certain range. Um, is this kind of, are these um, explosions growing? Um, that's a hypothesis. One member of the team decided to explore whether these things were kind of layers of exponentially growing spikes, perhaps. Um, that's an interesting um, idea to explore. Another person might wanted to just focus on the small fluctuations and ignore these larger ones. That's also a valid avenue of exploration. Um, when we think about, you know, whether these are ex- explosions or other kinds of flare-ups, um, it's worth referring back to the time scale that they're on. Um, are these slow explosions? Are these explosions that happen within nanoseconds? Because both of those would have different kinds of physics happening, different events. Um, we don't have earthquakes that happen within microseconds. They tend to last, you know, seconds and minutes. Um, similarly, you don't have, say, rainfall that starts and finishes, you know, within 0.1 second, it's, it's, it's a longer process. So the time frame, the time scale is important. Um, so let's look at the time scale. Let's kind of take the last and the first time. And if we looked back at that data, where were we? These are in seconds, the, um, the measurements. So if we convert from seconds to years, 60, 60, 24, 365, very roughly, um, we've got almost 14 years, 13.9 years of data. Great, so just before we continue, let's just recap what we've just done. We looked at the data, which is always a good thing to do, uh, periodically, you know, as through, after each significant step in your process, you should just check that your data looks like you think it should. When we first looked at it, we saw there was 
um, a, a big spike that looked very much like an error. So we removed it based on our hypothesis that there shouldn't be any negative values. And then we saw much more detail now because we removed that very large um, error from the data. So one of the very f first things that people do when they um, try to find patterns in data is to look for periodicity or repeating uh, features in the data. Um, it's almost, you know, the, the kind of a reflex action, the first thing that people do. Um, and it's useful because even if your repeating patterns aren't um, you know, cleanly sideways, for example, uh, anything that repeats will kind of show up um, in a in in a in this kind of analysis. So let's talk a little bit about this Fourier transform, which is so apparently powerful. Not everyone was familiar with it. So let's look at the top left here. We've got um, a very pure function. Um, it's a sine wave. You know, you can't get um, purer um, than a single sine wave and it has one frequency. So this signal, if we measure this as a signal from space or from any other source, you know, it's a musical note. Um, it's a pure musical note. It's only got one frequency, one tone. And what if we look at it instead of in the time kind of domain, but in the frequency domain, that is we're looking at it from the perspective of what frequencies are in this data. There's only one frequency because it's, it's it's a pure signal. This one here is another pure signal, but it's going up and down faster. Still a single um, tone, a single uh, frequency, but it's a higher frequency because it's going up and down faster. So if we do a Fourier transform, which converts from the time domain to the frequency domain and highlights the frequencies in that signal. Here we should only see one peak because there's only one frequency in this data and it's at a higher number so it's further to the right. You know, this might be number two and this might be number four frequency two and frequency four. This might be two cycles a second, this might be four cycles a second. So that's the idea of transforming from the time domain to the frequency domain. It's simply saying Let's look at that data instead of from the time perspective, how does it change over time? Let's look at it from the frequency perspective, which is let's look at what frequencies are in that data. Now, lots of data isn't actually consisting of a single pure signal. Um, you know, lots of signals have lots of component frequencies just because the mechanism that created that signal um, has lots of um, mechanisms at play which cause those frequencies. So this is a more complicated signal. It's actually not that complicated because I constructed it to be made up of two frequencies added together. So two sine waves, one of a say medium frequency and one of a high frequency combined looks a little bit more complicated but actually when you look at it through the frequency domain we can see straight away that it's a very simple signal it's only got two frequencies in it and this is a very powerful um, step you know it's very very useful to be able to pull out um, what frequencies are in in a signal and for example we might be able to say in a different kind of problem we might be able to say Oh, that's that's hydrogen there, and that's oxygen causing those those um, those different frequencies because they're you know causing light at different frequencies to to be emitted, for example. Um, <clears throat> in fact, that's how lots of um, detection work is done by looking at uh, what frequencies are in um, the radiation that we receive, and then working back to see well what 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 chemicals what 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 chemical processes cause that. Okay, so in the next one, which again looks moderately complex, um, it's here because it illustrates that actually 
yes, there are two frequencies in the signal, but one is a stronger, um, one is stronger than the other one in terms of amplitude. So if I have, um, actually it's best illustrated with a graph. So let's look at a graph. So here we've got the very simple signal. This one was at twice the frequency. This is the two combined. And this is where we have one sine wave and the other faster sine wave, but at double the magnitude. And that's where we got that from. So let's uh, have a go at um, applying that Fourier transform to the data. Um, the Python ecosystem is full of very useful um, data analytics tools. One of the most popular ones is SciPy, which provides a lot of the mathematical functions for working with data. I've provided some links there for you to have a look at later. They'll all be in the blog write-up as well for you to click on and, and read about yourselves. It's very simple. We um, import the SciPy library and apply the fast Fourier transform to the rate data. And then we plot the data. And as you can see, there doesn't seem to be any obvious signal, um, any obvious kind of dominant frequencies in that data. You know, all these frequencies look very small. This spike here is characteristic. Um, you know, a, frequen a frequency at zero is simply saying that there's a um, there's a kind of a constant component to the data, you know, with frequency zero meaning it it you know it centers around a non-zero uh, value. There's a DC component if 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 those words mean more to you. Um, we should also be careful when we interpret these graphs to spot um, sometimes harmonics of peaks, and we have to be careful how we interpret those. But we should be wary of things that are around the edges of these kinds of charts because they're not they're often effects of windowing the data or cutting it off <clears throat> because the assumption around the fast Fourier transform or the Fourier transform is that the data is infinite and continuous and smooth whereas we are not doing that we have discrete data and we've cut it off at certain point and that translates into uh, imperfections in the resultant um, picture of frequencies you can read a lot more about that um, and it would probably take a full video to explore that so at this point, the main message is just be careful about interpreting spikes in the Fourier, in the frequency domain if they're around the edge or if they are neighboring each other in terms of you know, a main spike and then spikes near it. So what we're taking away from this is that there appears to be nothing. Um, let's look more closely at this origin area where there seems to be something going on. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, what I've just done there is to say the first 100 values I'm plotting. Again, you know, there's not a lot going on there. There's there's one high starting point, which we know we should ignore. Um, perhaps we should have, you know, um, zeroed the data to kind of get rid of that. Um, but other than that, there isn't any obvious significant peak. And by significant, I mean statistically significant. There's nothing that sticks out head and shoulders above this kind of noise. So that's um, not as interesting. So that tells us that there isn't um, any repeating pattern in the data. There isn't any periodicity, so we should give up. Um, a few people in the group, you know, did apply this really interesting technique um, and, and and stopped at this point, um, which is really natural and you know well done to them for getting this far and thinking about applying you know, a Fourier transform. That's a really, really kind of good thing to do. Um, so let's kind of recap what we've done. We've looked at the data by transforming it into the Fourier, in the, into the frequency domain, and we appear to have found no repeating pattern. There are no dominant frequencies in the data. So it's just chaotic noise. Hmm. Let's look again at the data. Um, have we made some incorrect assumptions? 
So one of the things that um, kind of jumped out is this question of, is the data evenly sampled? So if I plot the data, you know, the timestamps growing one after another between where they start from and where they end up, if they were evenly spaced, they would go along this blue line but they're not evenly spaced, so they jump about a little bit. There's lots of ways of determining if the data, um, if the timestamps are evenly regular or not. This is just one of them. Um, the, the, the Python notebook has some code which kind of does that, but you you can find your own way of, of determining whether the timestamps are regular or not. You, you can plot them, for example, the differences, and you'll see that they, they're, not, um, they're not all the same. So this, this tells us that actually our assumption that the data was sampled evenly, that is, the satellite was collecting the data at evenly spaced time points, is wrong. Um, what does that mean then? That means that we shouldn't really be using that fast Fourier transform because an assumption of the fast Fourier transform is that the data is evenly sampled that the timestamps are regular. So it was naive of us to apply that. <clears throat> so one approach is perhaps to re resample the data ourselves, as in um, re kind of allocate data to time bins, uh, to time slots, um, which are regular. So we might say, you know, We'll have time slots say zero to one minute, and then one minute to two minutes, and then two minutes to three and four minutes, and then look at the original data and count up or add up or find the average of those measurements for each of those t more regular time periods. You know, there's words like rebinning or resampling. So that we, we can try that. Um, there's a little risk there that we might lose information in the data by resampling. Um, you know, it has a slightly blurring or averaging effect. And, and if you think about it, we, we have lost um, we have lost information by resampling because we've lost the actual time that the data was collected. We've we've kind of averaged it in some sense into this new regular grid of data of, of time time intervals. And why I've got that little cell there with a the number, I'll get rid of that. So let's do that. Let's resample the data. So we've got our data at the moment in terms of time and a rate. And if we look closely, we, we should have spotted it actually. It's not uh, regularly sampled. Um, in order to resample, I'm going to have to convert it to a time frame, a time, a date time format. So it's not a floating point number. It's, it's got a time format itself. This is just um, in preparation for using the resample uh, tool. And it's part of the pandas library as well. Really useful, isn't it? Um, I'm going to... So here I've told it that the source is in seconds. Um, it's arbitrary where it starts here in terms of 1974. The date doesn't matter. It's just the, 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 the growth um, in time that matters. I'm going to very sample it to a week just to see. So my, my time bins are now quite large. And I'm going to find the mean of all those points that would have, would fit into that week rather than say the sum or the minimum. Some bins will have no value and the default is to fill it with um, a type called not a number, but I'm going to replace them with zero. Um, and that's necessary in order to reapply the DFT, the um, discrete cosine transform you're using here. And let's plot um, the results again. So this is now the Fourier transform of the resample data. And there is a little bit more structure here, but if you've looked at lots and lots of Fourier transform, you'll know that there is too often a characteristic pattern which comes from noise. 
where you have um, almost like a bell-shaped um, kind of envelope for for kind of oscillation. So we're not going to read too much into that. Um, the nothing in here sticks out as a very significant peak. Um, so maybe one week was not um, not good. Hmm. If I do it um, every second, then on this particular computer, it, it'll run out of memory and, and, and won't work. Um, but you can try it yourself, and I suspect you won't find any um, peaks. Maybe you will. Um, I think the conclusion there is that by resampling the data, we've um, we've lost any crucial information. So let's go back up and kind of look at our data again. You know, take another step back. And what we had was 64,000 points over, what was it, a 14 year period from start to end. That means, let's just say it's a 10 year period. So 6,000 data points in a day, in, in a year, um, 600 in a month, very roughly. Um, so 30 days in a month, so that's so, so 20 in a day, something like that. It's not a lot, is it? There's not a you know, I'm, I'm just doing order of magnitude calculations in my head there, but the data sampling is not very frequent. You know, it's a, a, you know, a few a day. Um, is that really enough to find, you know, a, a repeating um, pattern? in the data, if there was something happening on Cygnus X3 that was happening you know, repeatedly, are we, are we measuring this information frequently enough to catch it? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So the, the, there's, there's an interesting alternative approach, um, which actually is very popular and common in astronomy and space physics, which is another way of trying to pull out periodic information, you know, frequencies. And it's particularly useful where the data is irregularly sampled. And that we found when we looked more closely was a feature of our data. You know, that's that's what destroyed the validity of using a of a Fourier transform. Um, let's explain what it is. So the fast Fourier transform is a very highly optimized algorithm. Um, it makes lots of assumptions. Um, you can read about them actually. Um, again, it, there's, there's a lot to say about it and we don't want to spend too much time in this video, but assumptions around um, the fact that the data is regularly sampled, other assumptions around um, how many data points we've actually got and whether we should be padding it out or not or repeating um, the data before we apply the function. There's lots of complexity there. Um, I guess my point there is that we often naively apply these functions without fully understanding the assumptions the algorithms make um, and what that means for interpreting their output. Um, so it's always worth really reading a little bit about that before you, before you kind of use those algorithms and over interpret the results. So this approach is a little simpler um, than the highly optimized uh, fast Fourier transform, which takes advantage of lots of symmetries and assumptions. Um, here, instead, it's more brute force. And if I explain it, it makes sense. All it does is test different frequencies to find which one best matches the data. Simple. You know, you can you can read lots of papers and books and chapters about the periodogram, uh, but really that's all they do. There's lots of variations of them, but essentially they just try different um, frequencies. As we're doing here, we can see the different waves here, different different frequencies, and the we can measure how well the, they fit the data using some kind of distance or error metric. Again, there's lots of options for for those as well. But the idea is, the worse the fit, the worse the error, or the higher the distance. Um, you can have least squares distances or other kinds of measures. But the point is that 
at some of those frequencies will better match the data than others and therefore will have a kind of a lower lower error so let's try that um, let's let's use the periodogram approach which is more brute force but actually doesn't make any assumptions around the data being periodically sampled the variation we're going to be using is called the Lom Skargel periodogram but you can use other ones as well I'll be providing some links which compare different periodograms and the different algorithms and you know, their benefits but broadly um, they do th roughly the same thing um, and then if you want to really try to you know fully interpret the results or pick one that's particular to your problem then, then it's worth kind of digging into what the differences are so we are going to be a bit naughty and just try all the frequencies um, from one which would be once one wave that covers a whole 14 years <laughs> a very long wave to one that um, has a frequency of say 64,000 because that's how many data points there are that's kind of a bit naughty in the sense that it's trying it all um, but if you had lots of data you would actually try ranges of frequencies um, and then kind of zoom in and get closer because it's kind of computationally expensive to do that. We're working out uh, the frequencies there just from the periods and this is using uh, a feature of you know sort of NumPy where it works at this is not one number this is a whole array and that's a whole array so it works at a whole array of frequencies and different algorithms will expect um, frequencies to be in different units this one will be the frequency times 2 times pi and angular frequency so just make sure you've got the right units for the algorithm that you choose and when I click run it'll take a few seconds because as I say it's brute force um, and I'm being a bit naughty by covering the whole range here from 1 to 64,000 um, so it's going to try all of those frequencies and build um, a, a chart really of which of those best matched the data. Let's see what it comes up with. It's taking a while. Oh, that took a while. Um, <clears throat> and we can see there is a very significant peak in the um, periodogram. Because it's such a high peak and very clear that tells us there's some confidence around there really being that period in the data. If this was a very noisy chart or perhaps it wasn't quite so high and there were medium sized peaks around it, we'd have more trouble interpreting its meaning. But this is statistically rather significant. Um, and we can work backwards from where this peak is to what that periodicity is. Now we could actually go backwards and work through you know, what's the angular frequency it occurs at and then what's the frequency and then what's the period but actually we can just look up the index of this point in the periods um, array so we can write some code to pick out the peak its index is this number here and in the periodogram the period is at the period happens to be at 0 0.005 that's that's where it is just to check 0 0.005 it's worth checking that looking it up in the periods array which is the uh, the frequencies in terms of cycles per second we can convert that to hours and we've got 4.79 now do we do we say that's 4 5 4.7 you know how much trust do we have in, in the accuracy of that figure um, we don't really have a lot um, to go on. Um, we'd have to do other independent studies and um, combine different measurements from different satellite um, kind of efforts to pull, pull to kind of collect data and combine it. Um, we can probably try and combine our result with other approaches that try to get the same period using a different route. 
to kind of corroborate the evidence. But the uh, the science, you know, the official information does suggest that the answer is 4.8 here in this publication. Um, let's look at another publication. This one from the Institute of Physics, I think it is. Um, and this one says 4.79 is approximately 4.79 hours. And that's what we found, 4.79 hours. So that's remarkably accurate. And what that is, is actually the period with which this binary system rotates, that the two objects in this binary system are going around each other uh, every 4.79 hours. So that's a pretty amazing result. We just used very simple code, you know, just looked at the data from the satellite and we managed to pull out this and detect this periodicity in this thing that's sort of hundreds of thousands of um, um, light years away. Is it, is it considered 240,000 light years away? I'd have to look it up, but it's very far away. Um, and we've made this um, conclusion that others have also found. So that's really rather interesting, um, rather amazing actually. Um, so it shows you the power of data analytics if we use the right tools and think a little bit about which tools, which algorithms match which problems are best. So let's just kind of summarize um, the key learning there and some of the good practice principles. We should always look at the data before we dive in so we know what we're getting into and whether it looks right at all. After each step in our processing, we should check, look at the data again. Is it what we expect to be the output of that step? Um, that, that should be kind of a habit. Um, and finally, check the assumptions of the tools that we use. Many of them have become very prevalent and people use them out of habit without really thinking, is it the right tool for this problem? And we saw here how applying um, the fast Fourier transform to unevenly sample data was wrong. Um, so that's that's the kind of conclusion there. I just want to finish with a bit of um, a kind of a silly point, really. The resampling approach that we tried, we tried um, sampling it sort of into time intervals of a day, a minute, and a week, and didn't find anything. Um, if I resampled it to an hour, I would have found the peak at 4.79 hours, but that's that's kind of luck, really. Um, you know, if I had resampled it to um, um, minutes, I should have seen that because that's uh, that's more granular. Um, but that didn't didn't happen. So th there, there's the possibility that we could have found it. Um, but we didn't know ahead of time what the right resampling um, approach, you know, what the right granularity had to be. Um, so the periodogram again is is the right answer for for this problem. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I'll write up the blog, and you know you can read it um, at a slower pace and follow some of the links to better understand how a periodogram works, how a fast Fourier transform works. Cheers. Bye.